Let us hear then the written word of the Lord from the Old Testament, <coughs> Job 19, 25 to 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Psalm 138, 7 and 8. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. Yahweh will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Isaiah 40, 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, and that she is received from Yahweh's hand double for all her sins. Hosea 3, 1. And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. From the New Testament, John 10, 28 through 30. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans eight sixteen and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. 37 through 39. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And First Peter 1, 3-5. through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy... He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So far the written word. O Lord our God, we ask by your Spirit, to give to us the heartfelt confidence of your unfailing love, your covenant promises, and the sure work of Christ, so that we may indeed have the same confidence as those who wrote the scriptures, revealing to us your will. So we pray that we would find true assurance in your promises and glorify your name as is right for those who have been given so great a gift as life from the dead. So we pray for the glory of your name in the church and for the comfort of believers. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The Christian church has been given the incredible duty, but also privilege of speaking of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, of speaking of life from the dead. And the church should pursue this mission with joy and with vigor, declaring to the world the excellencies of the grace of God. Unfortunately, very quickly, the church runs into a problem, and that is, prideful hearts. But it doesn't start from outside, it starts from within, where we as the Christian church are a little bit troubled by this idea of grace alone, because it unfortunately means that God finds nothing in us to reward, and he must be entirely gracious for us to be saved as we bring nothing to the table. We bring nothing to the bargain except our sins. And then, of course, when we go outside and you tell the world, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, well, many people will say, you know, the virtuous pagan. There are people who do good. In fact, I know people outside the church better than inside the church. Are you saying none of them are worthy of life from the dead, of an everlasting inheritance? And then they put you on the defensive. 
Well, we know that all men die, which reveals to us that all are under the judgment of sin. And therefore, we should not be ashamed of what God has revealed in his word, but rather we should boldly proclaim these things, knowing that it is not our reasoning, our argumentative abilities, but rather it is the spirit of God making alive the dead. However, as we said, the church was compromised. And unfortunately, throughout the period of the early church and through the Middle Ages, the Roman church in the West became very corrupted, where more and more, a very typical thing for every organization and bureaucracy, the health of the organization became more important than the mission. You see this with almost every business, every company, where they start with a focus of producing a product, providing a service. Eventually, you wind up with an entire team of people who are more interested in keeping their jobs over actually serving the customer. Then old corporations become corrupted, bloated, new corporations arise. Well, the church is a body of men gathered together. We make the same mistakes as a church. And so the Reformation, in many ways, was people within the church rediscovering its mission. And they realize it's not about the church as an organization that people should just be in the church, but rather the church's mission was to declare the excellencies of the gospel, of the name of Jesus to the world. And to do this rightly, they went back and studied the word, as they said in Latin, ad fontes, to the sources, to the original word. And they discovered that Things had been mistranslated, doctrines had built up that were untrue, and the Reformation then said, no, Scripture alone, we need to stop relying on the fathers as having equal weight, but they should be seen as interpreters. We need to speak of what Scripture teaches, which is Christ alone is a Savior. This salvation he gives to us is by his grace alone, and it is our faith that embraces this thing, and we have no worth or worthiness in us. And this brings all the glory to God because he doesn't share it with us because we have nothing to bring that makes us worthy of being his children or of being members of his church. Unfortunately, even in the Reformation, very early on, this gets corrupted. So ob objections are raised to these doctrines because it, it hurts the pride of men. Even regenerate men are still unglorified and have the problem of pride. So unfortunately, as errors entered in, the church had to fight against it, and so they met in Synod at Dortrecht. This is a city in modern-day Holland, or, or Netherlands, and they formulated five points, and they did a great favor to the church. They said, it's time for the church to systematically, using scripture, lay out the arguments necessary for anyone to know and understand what God has said about who is man and how God saves sinners. So this comes to what now is called the five points, where we speak of man's total depravity. In other words, there is no part of us that is good. No one seeks for God. There is no one righteous, no, not one. And therefore, there's no one who is going to be able to seek for and find God in themselves. God, therefore, must not look for some worth in us, but rather without conditions in us, he saves. He writes the name of the elect in the book of life before the foundation of the world. And these people who have been designated to eternal life are then purchased by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ who makes full payment for their sins. And those who have been redeemed in this way are then brought near to God. They are made alive by the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is irresistible as the dead are made alive. Just like creation could not resist being created when God spoke the word, so also when the preached word of the gospel goes forth to the elect, they are irresistibly drawn in, as in John 6, it speaks of like a fishnet drawing people in. The fish don't really get a vote or a choice in that. And lastly, they are preserved, and that's what we have been looking at in Head 5 of the Canons of Dort. This idea of perseverance, many people unfortunately use licentiously. In other words, they see it as if I have given the magic words, the formulation of the sinner's prayer, or whatever it is, I'm eternally secure. But that's not what perseverance teaches. Rather, it speaks of those who've been made alive and children of God who've been given his spirit are preserved by God and delight in the things of God and desire to grow in holiness and to be more and more Christ-like. And rather than seeing this as a security whereby they can 
ignore the will of God and still be saved. Rather, it is their joy that they've been given such a gift. They want to express their thankfulness to God and therefore pursue righteousness and holiness. So we love this doctrine. It is a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, human reason draws us away from it. On the one hand, we like the idea of security for ourselves and we like the idea that we can go on sinning and still be saved because God's bound. We gave the magic words. But more likely, most people in the church have not been licentious in terms of doctrine. In other words, we all recognize the Ten Commandments reveal the mind of God. We all see Jesus as holy. So while there's always a small percentage that will, usually only for a time, speak of licentiousness as being okay because you're secure, most of the church actually falls into the trap of legalism, moralism. This idea that we need to grow in holiness. And what they wind up doing is they say the doctrine of perseverance, of God keeping us from falling, will make us lazy. So they actually take that away and they seek to excuse God for foolishly having told us that indeed he will uphold us forevermore. And so the Roman church, seeing passages like that Paul has written and that Jesus preached, that John recorded, that speak of us being held by God and preserved forever, They said, well, no, no, those were special revelation for a few particular individuals. And really the only ones who knew were Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Paul, because they can't deny Paul is clearly expressing he cannot be lost. They said, but that was special revelation for them. It's not for you. Don't feel secure. You need to keep striving. You need to keep working. And if you for a minute think you are secure, it will lead you to become callous and lazy towards the things of God and you will become sinful and licentious. So they teach that apart from special revelation, you can have no assurance of your future perseverance in this life. You should live doubting. You should be struggling always. However, having set forth the actual biblical teaching of perseverance, now having set forth the orthodox teaching, the biblical teaching, the synod rejects the errors of those who teach that apart from special revelation. No one can have assurance of this future perseverance in this life. And our reason? Because by this teaching, the well-founded consolation of true believers in this life is taken away. And the doubting of the Romanists is reintroduced into the church. Holy Scripture, however, in many places, derives this assurance not from special and extraordinary revelation, but from the marks peculiar to God's children and from God's completely reliable promises. So especially the Apostle Paul, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 8, and John. They who obey his commands remained in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he remains in us by the spirit he gave us. So that's the doctrine we are looking at, and that's why these verses are chosen. We've actually looked at, I think, almost all of these passages as we were looking at the positive affirmation of this doctrine. But a quick reminder. Here is Job, having lost all the blessings of God. I mean, he's able to breathe, but only enough that he can continue suffering. His friends are convinced he has sinned against God. But he is sure that God is not punishing him for a particular sin But he doesn't understand the providence of God. But even in this, he is sure of one thing. God is his redeemer. And that he will see God as redeemer ruling upon the earth. So what earthly confidence at this point does Job have that he is a child of God? Well, looking at his life, none. His friends know he's wrong. Everything around him tells him, God is angry at me. My life's falling apart. But the sure promise of God is there for him. So he says, no, I know God is my redeemer and it's not based on my circumstance that I observe. The psalmist, Psalm 138, knows that life is difficult. I walk in the valley of trouble, in the midst of troubles. But in spite of this, it's not my circumstance. It's you being my God that matters. So you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand. You keep the wrath of my enemies away, 
By your right hand, you deliver me. Why? Because the God who is fulfills his purposes for me. And his covenantal, his steadfast love is everlasting. And so because of these promises, he then prays according to the will of God, do not forsake the work of your hands. So you see there in the psalmist, he's basing his security entirely on the power and purpose and revealed will of God. As Isaiah prophesies of the time of judgment coming upon Jerusalem, he also sends with it this word of comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. To the prophet, he says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and let her know that her warfare, her struggles have ended. Her sin is forgiven because God has made payment for these sins. Israel sins against God with idolatry, bringing in false worship. They reject the true God. They forsake the covenant. They're in exile. Why do they have any hope? Because God makes payment for their sins and forgives it. And that's why Psalm 32, blessed is the man whose sins are covered. Not blessed is the man who has made enough meritorious works to cancel out his debt, but the one whom God has chosen to forgive. And that's why the prophet Hosea was given this mission of having a wife who would then commit adultery as a prostitute and be in the home of another man. And he is told, go and bring her back, paying off the debt that she owes, because in this you are going to show the kind of love I have for Israel, bringing Israel back to me, even though Israel would rather have the idols. So Hosea... You are going to love this woman who prostitutes herself and even you're paying off her debt and bringing her back to your own home as your wife because you are going to model for Israel my love for them. The Lord Jesus says the following about his sheep. Remember that in this passage in John 10, he speaks of these Jewish leaders not hearing his voice because you are not my sheep. But to you who are my sheep, know this. I, the good shepherd, lay down my life for the sheep And by doing so, I, in my work, give you eternal life. And because my power is so great and I've given you life, you will never perish. But not only that, even if Satan and hell itself should come against you, they will not snatch you out of my hand. But it's not even just me. The Father, who is greater than all, is also holding you in his hand So between the Father and the Son upholding you, no one is going to snatch you away. Your life cannot perish. This is the word Jesus gives to his sheep. Therefore, the Apostle Paul can declare to us that we can be confident of God's love because, remember, it was unconditioned on our performance. He loved us while we were sinners, so much so that the only begotten Son of God died for us while we were still sinners. And now that his spirit dwells in us, you think now he's going to forsake you? He chose you when you were way, way worse. But he made you his own. And therefore, by Romans 8, he can speak of, there is therefore today, at this moment, no condemnation for those who are, by the work of the spirit, in a mystical union with Jesus Christ. You are in Jesus. You are seen by God for judgment as Jesus himself would be because you are in him for the purposes of you're looking at merit and judgment. In fact, as we saw there from 1 Peter that by the, I'm sorry, uh, uh, as we saw in 1 John, the spirit that God gave us gives us this assurance. Well, here's expanded this idea in Romans 8. The Spirit of God himself bears witness with our own spirits that we are children of God. And if we are children of God, then we are heirs. We are going to inherit everything. Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, not provided as a condition you do this, but provided you recognize this call. You are also in a world that hates God going to suffer as Jesus did in order that you may also with him receive the glory due his name. So the Apostle Paul is very, very clear to his readers. While you were the enemy of God, he sent his only begotten son to die for you. Because of that, you are now 
sure to escape condemnation because already the judgment has passed. Remember in John 5, we looked at the idea of the first resurrection, that of the spiritually dead are made alive. Therefore, the second death has no uh, threat to you because you don't belong to the world. It is going to go through the second death and even more so. And you have to be, you have to really be impressed with this. God is not giving any wiggle room to the people who talk about falling away. Because Paul writes the following in John 8, 37 through 39, having listed all these problems, nakedness, peril, sword, whatever. No, even with every single thing I have listed, we overwhelmingly conquer. We are more than conquerors, not by our strength, but through Jesus who loved us. In fact, I have this expressed confidence, death nor life, Again, by speaking of opposites, you include everything in the middle. Angels, rulers, things present or things to come. The present, the future, nothing. Powers, height, depth. Just to be clear, nothing at all in all of the created order will be able to separate us from the love of God. Because the love of God for us is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul wants us to be absolutely assured because the Spirit is giving him this gospel message to the people. Rest in Christ. Be confident of the love of God. Yes, you will face trials and tribulations. Remember, there's nakedness, peril, sword, hunger, death. But you will not be separated from the love of God for you in Jesus Christ. And therefore, you can be assured there is no condemnation for you because you have already had your sins paid for. You are forgiven. You who were an adulteress are now made to be the bride of Christ, the church. And so Peter writes, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, according to his great mercy, he caused us to be born again. We didn't choose. We didn't act. He caused us to be born again to a hope that is alive. Not to a hope that is vain, but a living hope. This by observing and knowing the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Guaranteeing to us an inheritance that will not perish, that will not be defiled, that will not be fading away. And it is part of the creation, or not the creation, but of the age to come. Kept in heaven for you. Who by God's power, you, are being guarded through the faith worked in you. For salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Why can you be so sure that you have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you? Because faith is being worked in you by the Spirit who made you alive and united you to Jesus Christ. It is not your works. It is God's will, Christ's work, applied by the Spirit, uniting you to him. And because of this Spirit, not only do you have confidence, but a desire for thankful living. That's why we don't speak of security, which leads to license, but rather the promises of God, which leads to a heartfelt thankfulness that makes us desire to more and more be prepared for this place to which we will go. The new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, where we will enjoy the blessings of creation as was intended. So we utterly reject the teaching that we need to keep people a little unsure in order that they work for it and grow in holiness. It's not biblical. It may fit human psychology, but that's not what God wants us to know. Our salvation is all of grace. Our election is of grace. The work of Christ is of grace. The application of that through the preached word is of grace. And our perseverance is of grace. And therefore, we should be of all people the most thankful in all the earth. Let's pray. O Lord, our God. We give you thanks for this great hope of life, which is ours, and all this as a free gift from you. And we pray more and more as we continue to mature in the faith that our expression of thankfulness will grow, that it will be more mature each and every day, and we will desire to see your name exalted. And Lord, wanting to know that your name would be honored, we would not bring shame upon your church, but rather we would strive for holiness and righteousness in order that the world would see your power working in mere vessels of clay, making us actually Christ-like. So we ask, O Lord, 
delight in the work that you are doing in your church and make us to be thankful and rejoice in this wonderful work being done in our lives individually in order that we would reflect the image of Christ and we would be assured that as more and more we love your law, that this is the spirit working in us, a heartfelt confidence. We are your children and heirs of the promise. So we thank you for this blessed hope given to us through Christ and his gospel. Amen. Amen. Well, we will conclude then by singing Psalm 138, which we quoted, verses 7 and 8. But we'll sing the whole of it. With all my heart, my thanks I bring. Please stand. <laughs>